and welcome to another recording of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. We're back for more news, tech content, and wisdom from the world of marketing. Joining me is a man on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the marketing and finance podcast, and the author of Cats, Mats, and Marketing Plans, and give you Monsieur Roger Edwards. Oh, hello. Thank you so much. And my co-host is also a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing. He's the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. And please welcome Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you very much, Roger. This is episode 33. 33. We are so approaching one year of this podcast. I was looking actually, yes, um, we went live after the launch or the announcement, you know, in July of 2020. Uh, We came up with the idea during lockdown. So (laughs) a year later, we're still in lockdown, but things are easing up, but not to the point where people can still see each other, hug each other and spend time with their friends. So what we're going to do with Roger is try and bring a bit of light entertainment as well as, you know, some information that can help you create better content faster and be in general a better marketer. So Roger, let's begin with In The News. Let's do it. After repeated complaints about what their algorithm chose to display, Twitter is testing an improved design for sharing in full, larger and higher quality images, including 4K photos. Right, well, the European Union published recently their Digital Compass Plan, which includes doubling computer chip manufacturing, 5G access and gigabyte internet connectivity by 2030, and to create its first quantum computer. Google recently announced that they are working on a new experience that combines Search Console and Google Analytics data to provide you with more useful data about your site. And Amazon Prime Video France produced a new video show just for TikTok called Cité. Cité is in French. Viewers will follow a group of friends using the app to explore France's cultural heritage. IKEA has launched 5050, a digital card game on Instagram stories, asking participants to share their least favourite household chores and, in a fun way, highlight inequality at home. Following the global successes of Killing Eve, Fleabag and Normal People, BBC Three will return as a TV channel in January 2022 after being moved to BBC iPlayer in 2016. After an initial test in 2018 and a limited rollout in September 2020, Instagram Lite, the 2 megabyte version of the Facebook app, is now available in 170 countries around the world. And finally, Cadbury has launched a virtual Easter egg hunt in partnership with Google Maps Street View. Called the Cadbury Worldwide Hide, you can hide an Easter egg, Roger, anywhere in the world and share a personalised clue with a loved one. (laughs) <laughs> well, I quite like that. Um, Cadbury's doing something with uh, with cream eggs. I mean, the, the cream eggs is a bit of a joke in our house because we always think, you know, on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, we'll, oh, do you think the cream eggs will be out in the shops yet? Because they always seem to just appear <laughs> as soon as Christmas is over. Well, yes, it's just, you know, the Easter Bunny just doing that. But what is lovely about this competition or the, 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 the kind of the uh, the Easter egg hunt is not only can you hide the virtual eggs, so it's almost some uh, kind of uh, throwback to the Pokemon Go uh, craze. But of course, if, for example, you know, your niece or nephew has found the virtual egg, then you can also give access to a voucher to order you know, the actual egg online. So it's not so mean that people only have to enjoy <laughs> a virtual egg. Can I ask you your reaction to the fact that Facebook was able to create a two megabyte version of Instagram? Bear in mind that the um, actual platform, the full version, I think is hundreds of megabytes, you know, uh, occupying memory on your phone, which is really for countries where there isn't the connectivity or the kind of smartphones that we enjoy here. But that seems such an achievement. It does, doesn't it? I suppose it also highlights how maybe bloated Instagrams become <laughs> because obviously they've, they've put stories in there there's there's uh, reels in there in addition to all the original functionality so I'm, I'm guessing that Instagram Lite is probably what Instagram looked like like 10 years ago when it first got launched I think it's just a smart move, and and I think people do enjoy simplicity, do they not, Monsieur Roger Edwards? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and for me, it's this idea of okay, well, if you can do that, what else can you do? 
Uh, I know that the version essentially means that you don't necessarily download all the photos and the videos. You can call them on your phone, but it's just a, an interesting way uh, for connectivity, so for technology to progress. So it's not just bigger, faster all the time. But talking of bigger and faster, although I never did officially complain, I was only one of the many that I used to to moan about Twitter and how poorly the uh, how poor the display was of my photos and videos. Yes, and yeah, a- again. Th- it's one of these slightly annoying things about social media, isn't it? That every platform, the dimensions that they'll allow photographs to be displayed in uh, is slightly different. So you know, you and I both use Canva to create images. And, and, and sometimes if you post an image to, to Twitter, it gets cropped by the algorithm, doesn't it? Uh, whereas if you want to be absolutely certain that it's going to fit, you almost like have to take a photograph, put it into Canva and then use their template for a Twitter post and, and actually reduce it to the correct uh, dimension so that it actually shows up. I know, and and very often, you know, you end up having to just give up and have something that is a compromise where it doesn't show the full pictures, or if you've been using text on the picture, Roger, you know, some of the text is hidden. But yeah, so I hope that the test is conclusive and they're just going to roll it out. And the 4K photos, some of the stuff we're going to see soon are going to look absolutely stunning. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. I mean, yeah, photographs do benefit from better um, resolution, don't they? Absolutely, especially if you've got that the contrast between background and foreground. You know, you can create such amazing photographs and they do need to be displayed in their true resolution. So I hope you didn't mind and our viewers and listeners didn't mind, but I did choose the uh, news about Amazon Prime Video France. And there was two reasons for that, Roger. The context is that at this moment in time, there is a bit of a backlash against Amazon Prime Video in France because of the lack of choice when it comes to movies and TV series. So I have many conversations with my families where I kind of sing the praises of the Amazon Prime we have in the UK and the many movies I can see. And they say, we, we have hardly any options. It's really, really quite limited. So I wonder if that's that's the context. But also, TikTok, as we know, is for a younger audience. Case in point, the series that they are creating is about a group of, I imagine, young friends having to explore France cultural heritage. I'm wondering whether it's an attempt to buy Amazon Prime Video France to regain uh, its audience by saying, you know, don't despair. You know, the good stuff is coming your way. Possibly, although you know, if the, if the people are genuinely concerned that there's a lack of content on on Amazon in France, if they're doing this on TikTok, it's it's probably only going to target, as you say, the young audience. Yeah. They're not they're not going to be uh, they're not going to be making hap- making the others happy. The you know people of our age and and, and whatever. So maybe they've they've got to do a bit more than just this to to get that audience back. But it is interesting, isn't it, that you you know you've focused in on that they're using tiktok and then the next news item was ikea doing something on instagram stories it seems to me that more and more brands are getting into the sort of the the bite-sized videos like tiktok and and reels and and, and all of that sort of things it's very interesting yeah i mean once again you know we only react uh, to the news that you know essentially reach our desk and and we choose headlines that allow us to reflect and, and and consider a few things I couldn't help but think about BBC Three. So Mm -hmm. it's almost uh, embarrassing, I would say, for the BBC to kind of having to backtrack, saying, you know, the reason why BBC Three went on BBC iPlayer, Roger, is because it was deemed by the powers of BBC they wasn't performing well enough. So it was demoted to online only. And then now, because of the success of Killing It, but also series like you know, BBC Click and so on, it's now being promoted yet again to a TV channel. So I think for me, there's a lesson is if you're working for a brand that is demoted in, in a view of an audience or, or, or kind of authorities, don't despair. You know, Just keep doing what you do best. You never know. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, yeah, I, I like Killing Eve. I like some of the content, especially Click that you've mentioned that came out on BBC Three. So I was actually quite disappointed back in 2016, although I wouldn't have said it was that long ago, I have to say. But yeah, I was a bit disappointed when it disappeared. So yeah, it'd be good to see it back. No, absolutely. Well, Monsieur Edwards, that was an interesting set of uh, news, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Again, fascinated by the what these brands are doing to use social media in their marketing at the moment. All right. Well, let's slow things down a little and let's move on to content spotlights. 
Now, in this segment, Roger and I surprise each other with a discovery from the interweb, an article, a podcast, a webinar, indeed, a short video. So, Roger, what have you got for us this week? This week, I've got a video, Pascal. Mm -hmm. Now, this video ticks a lot of boxes for me. A, it's about the airline industry. And as somebody who used to travel pretty much weekly on aircraft um, and have not set foot on a plane for an entire year because of the lockdown, anything to do with planes is always going to attract my attention. Secondly, it's an economics-based article, uh, uh, video. And and as you know, way back in the day, I did an, uh, a part economics degree and marketing degree back at Leeds University. So I'm often drawn to economic theory. And uh, this is really, really interesting. Now, the title of the article is called The Turbulent Economics of the Airline Industry. And actually, it's a bit worrying watching this, Pascal, because do you remember way, way back in the 50s and 60s, air travel was actually a very, very expensive um, pastime. And it was almost the exclusive, um, it was only exclusively accessible to people who had quite a lot of money. And it was not really until about 20, 25 years ago that the low cost airlines started to appear that the price of air travel plummeted to incredibly, you know, almost bus fare type levels, which allowed more and more people to travel more and more. You know, okay, we had package holidays starting in the in the in the sixties, um, and that was subsidized air travel to a certain extent, but the low cost revolution was about 20, 25 years ago. So the video goes into quite a lot of detail about how airlines price their tickets. Now, as you know, on a long haul aircraft, airlines tend to have different classes of travel. So they'll have first class at the front, which is super posh, usually a massive seat that turns into a bed and it'll be real fine dining, very expensive champagne. The next is business class, which often has a flatbed these days, but a smaller flatbed than you would get in in, uh, first class and decent meals and and champagne as well. Some airlines have premium economy, which is basically economy with a bit more leg room and a slightly wider seat and maybe an improved meal. And then, of course, the majority of the plane at the back is the economy seats, which are usually crammed in 10 abreast or something like that on a a 777. And the, the way that airlines price their tickets in the main is that they make the majority of their profits on first class and business class. And the reason they make so much money on them, A, is they can charge the rate because people want to sit in luxury, but also the majority of business travellers have to often be quite flexible in their travel needs and therefore they would like to change their tickets at the last minute. And when they do that, um, it's often they have to pay a fully flexible fare for the travel and they are incredibly expensive tickets. And so it really subsidises the rest of the aircraft. Now, the economy seats might be relatively cheap, but they are being subsidised to a massive extent by first class and business class. And what this video is saying is that this was almost like perfect equilibrium until the pandemic. Now, what's happened in the pandemic is that obviously airline fleets have been grounded, but also as things start to open up again, businesses have realised that they can save an absolute shed load of money by not sending their people travelling. And even if they did send them travelling, they're not going to send them in first class or business class. Why would they invest so much money? So what this is saying is that when things come back, a lot of businesses are just not going to be traveling anymore. And therefore, the business class and the first class seats aren't going to be able to subsidize the cheap affairs down the back. Now, you could argue, oh, yeah, but there's still quite a lot of people who go on holiday who quite like to spring for first class or business class because, you know, they want to make it part of the holiday. But those people are usually paying a discounted first class or business class fare because they don't need the flexibility. They know they're going on holiday on the 3rd of April and coming back on the 10th of April. Whereas a business traveler, because they need, they may have to change their mind at the last minute they have to pay so much more for the flexibility so those cheaper business class seats aren't the profitable ones and what this video is saying is that if business travel doesn't come back and airlines effectively have to either reduce the size of the cabins or bring the price down then that's going to have a knock-on effect and increase the price 
of the economy seats. And we might then start to see a return to the days of the 50s and the early 60s when air travel became very, very expensive. Now, then he just says, ah, but a lot of you will be sitting there saying, ah, but this doesn't apply to short haul, does it? This doesn't apply to short haul. We've got the Ryanairs and we've got the EasyJets. They are all economy cabins. And that's true to a certain extent. But what I hadn't realised, Pascal, until this video pointed out to me, is that business travellers still use Ryanair and they still use EasyJet and they're still buying those fully flexible tickets. Even though they're not getting champagne or bigger seats, they're still paying for the flexibility. And that is the flexibility that creates the profit for the airline. So again, if we come to the situation where businesses aren't sending people travelling as much and they're more that more happy to do conferences by Zoom or just meetings by Zoom, they're going to lose out on those flexible short-haul tickets as well. And of course, a lot of airlines like British Airways, Lufthansa, Air France, a lot of their short-haul networks are merely feeders into their hub, like Charles de Gaulle or Heathrow, for their long-haul flights. So economically, depending upon how we come out of lockdown and how things settle down from a business travel point of view, we all might find, as much as we want to travel again, that air travel all of a sudden becomes a lot more expensive, even for those cheap seats. And it's not really something I thought about until I watched this video. So I really, anybody who travels, especially by air, even if you you know don't travel on business, but you occasionally want to spring for a posh seat for a holiday, go and watch this video and just see what you think. The link will be in the show notes. Uh, but it, it certainly made me think about the future of my travel. Thank you so much for that, Roger. You know, it's lovely to have something a little different, but also mm. challenging in a way. I was, you, know, you got me thinking. It was a real cerebral challenge uh, because I was thinking about the news, for example, or the the content spotlights of the past for us about you know people wanted to work from home more, people who didn't want to travel as much. We talked about the Aco Hotel chain who are expecting hybrid events where some will be in the the business rooms or the, the conference rooms, but others will be just you know logging in and watching it virtually so and i must confess apart from like you wishing for things to you know be different so i could travel again i'm not giving any thought to the economics of of traveling um and whether you know we're going to see a parallel with train with cruising you know and, and that kind of things because the cruise industry has been hit hard as well i mean sadly some of them literally had um localized kind of um, you know infections and they had to stay away from harbors and ports if you remember th those stories from uh, last year and and this idea of yes you know business travelers or frequent travelers helping subsidize literally the airline industry if they don't travel then the um operators are going to have to start to review the excel spreadsheet and start to move numbers around to make it to make it work and it's going to have a knock-on effect to things like conference and events and, mm -hmm. and speakers like our, like you and me who do travel to present at conferences. You know, A, the conferences may not carry on if, if people aren't willing to travel to them, and that's going to have a knock-on effect to the events industry and also to people like you and me who up until now have travelled to speak. Wow. Do you remember who produced a video by any chance, Roger? It's, uh, it's actually a... Um, a series of videos it's called economics explained it's a youtube channel called economics explained uh so you know it's all about supply and demand and uh, macroeconomics and gross national product and stuff like that it's quite dry quite a dry topic but this particular one because it was airplane focused just caught my attention but ultimately, as marketers and, and content marketers, we have to be uh, aware of the you know, the bigger picture, as we would call it. So uh, now, thanks for that, Roger. Really appreciate it. So for my part, I wanted to bring to your attention a an article that was sent to me by the platform Headliner.app. Do you remember? It was reviewed as part of Marketing Tech and Apps. And I was making the claim that although Headliner.app uh, claims to be the number one platform to help you promote your podcast, I was saying that the audiogram that you can produce thanks to the platform can help you pr promote any content, not just podcast. So, of course, because I've got an account with the Headliner, I received a newsletter. And in this newsletter, there was an article which had the following title, Nine Creative Tweets to Promote Your Podcast on Twitter. 
And what I said to you, Roger, is yes, but this time would be so much better if it said nine creative tweets to promote your content on Twitter. So I'm going to continue with this line of thoughts. But you know, yes, Headliner is amazing for promoting a podcast because of the audiogram. As a reminder for our audience, an audiogram is a static image, which you can play as a video because you can hear the sound and you can see the sound wave moving from left to right or pulsating if you're using that particular template. And I wanted to kind of list for you and our audience, Roger, the nine suggested, you know, creative tweets with this idea of it could be anything, not just a podcast. So of course, number one option would be to be a podcast trailer. My argument would be, why don't you do a blog post trailer? So talk about your you know, blog article using audio only and create an audiogram accordingly. I don't think you would want to go maybe to do a video trailer with just audiogram, but what wouldn't you? What is interesting with regard to Twitter, a reminder, is that the maximum length for a normal video is 2 minutes and 20 seconds, unless you're following Roger's advice to use the Twitter Media Studio, which you reviewed a few weeks ago. Number two, a guest announcement. So why don't you, using voice only, announce a guest at your next conference, Roger? perhaps your next live Q&A and so on, and again, create an audiogram for that. But that could be for anything, not just a podcast. A new listener intro. So this is interesting. The recommendation was, if you've been running a podcast or a blog series, or in your case, Roger, the Roger Vlog series and all for a while, for a new kind of uh, follow-up, it could be quite overwhelming to see all this content. So what they're recommending is to do an audiogram where you, Roger, would maybe highlight maybe your top five videos on Roger Vlog, or in my case, the, the top five videos as part of Content Marketing Studio. And I must confess, I've never thought of that. So literally, the tweet would read, new to Roger Vlog, well, here's the top five for you to, to get started. So I thought it was a lovely way to get new listeners or readers or watchers on board. And number four, play up your theme as it's listed on, on the article. That means that you are obviously the uh, the custodian of your core theme as part of your content marketing. So why don't you use an audiogram to remind people about what it is? That could be, for example, curating an article. So to date, Roger, the practice is if you found an article and you would just copy and paste a link, put a few words, and then press to, uh, post or tweet, why don't you do an audiogram where you're gonna quickly summarize what this article is about? Why don't you actually talk about something that is important to you and simply make it an audio post? So that was an interesting one. Number five, behind the scenes. I think, you know, people do that. So we normally take a picture for behind the scenes or we may do a quick Instagram story. Why don't you do an audiogram where you maybe maybe have the sound of a busy office or maybe the sound of a, of a team meeting? Number six, talk to your fans. Well, since this is about audiogram, why don't you say welcome to somebody? Why don't you say thank you? Why don't you actually give people a shout and using an audiogram as opposed to just an at Roger Edwards on Twitter, which I think has a lovely kind of human element to it. Number seven, explain with a visual. Now, this is interesting. So let's say, Roger, that you wanted to create a summary of indeed, you know, the video that you reviewed for us, what you can do is create an audiogram where you've taken time to create the graphics to upload on Headliner to then describe the graphic. And so, by the way, on my website, I've got the 10 steps to do this better, or my website, I've got this following podcast, and you can summarize visually the different steps or the different key elements, but also um, paraphrase using your voice. I thought that was a lovely little idea. Number eight, give them something extra. So all of us have um, eBooks, you've got downloads, you've got checklists, you've got free resources, just big up your own resources with an audiogram. So describe to me, Roger, your checklist, describe to me indeed, you know, the book for that matter. And then number nine, something for them to look forward to. So always try and find a way to let people know in advance about your plans for content marketing. Now, normally what we say to people is say, watch this space in a week's time, Roger, there's going to be a brand new blog post. You would write that. Well, my view would be, why don't you say it in the future? So it was not what the article was intending to do, which was about just promoting your podcast. What I'm saying is you can use Headliner to take it beyond those kind of boundaries and have nine different ways to use audio only with a lovely kind of added feature of the sound waves moving about to really, really make your tweets more creative. This this is great. I mean, again, the, 
at first you think, oh, this is just going to be the bleeding obvious, isn't it? But I'm going down this, and, you know, the one I got excited about was the new listener intro. Mm. You know, I mean, as a, as a podcast host and as the Rog Vlog video host, you know, you think, oh, it's so obvious to do that. But I hadn't actually thought about it. And for the marketing and finance podcast, which is now up to about 270 episodes, wow. obviously... A, a, a new listener intro would be such a great idea. So, you know, again, you can write off articles like this by saying, oh, I've heard all of these before, but often you haven't, and it's great to be reminded. And, and do you know what? This has sparked something else, Pascal. So a slight tangent here, if, if you if you will allow mm. me. But do you remember the Twitter feature that was launched about, probably about um, uh, nine months ago, we talked about it very early on, in, on Two Geeks in the Marketing Podcast, is this ability to record an audio tweet, which actually shows you the wavy line as well. And that got quite a lot of criticism because it wasn't um, friendly for deaf people. That's right. There was yeah. no there was no ability to put um, uh, subtitles upon the screen, uh, so it would be very very difficult for hard of hearing people to to actually know what was going on, and and Twitter effectively stopped the rollout of that um, of that feature. Now I noticed just this morning that that has now appeared on my own personal Twitter account. So they've obviously started to roll it out again. Now, I have had access because I manage a couple of other um, uh, Twitter accounts for a couple of clients, and that, uh, they got access to it nine months ago, and I played with it and thought, no, nah, I don't like this, and, and effectively left it there. But I, it is interesting to see that it has appeared on my personal account today, so they are rolling it out further. So I do need to check it now to see whether they've advanced it enough to solve that problem that it doesn't have subtitles. No, absolutely. And you know what's interesting? Uh, yes, by the way, thank you for a reminder, Roger. Headliner does allow the transcription as well. Yeah. You're using an iPhone, aren't you? Because I don't have it yet. So I'm assuming it's an iPhone rollout because it is deemed to be an easier interface to, to get the apps uh, onto. Probably, probably. Well, actually, I've used the term apps enough as it is to <laughs> use it as a very straightforward segue into marketing tech and apps. Now, in this section, which I believe to be one of Roger's favorites, we surprise each other and you, our audience, with new tech and apps that can make life easier as a content creator and marketer. So, Roger, what have you got for us this week? Okay, one audio and one video for you this week, Pascal. Uh, came across this one almost by accident, um, and I have to say that I have just um, signed up for the free trial, but literally only today, so I can't actually report on exactly how it works so part of revealing this app is to get feedback from you the listeners and the watchers of two geeks in a marketing podcast if you are using this app then let us know it's called eloquence uh, i don't know whether i pronounced that right it's e-l-o-c-a-n-c-e -E. and the proposition is that you can turn web articles pdfs emails pretty much any written copy it will transfer it for you into audio that you can then listen to as if it was a podcast now a couple of caveats to this uh, you have to upload whatever it is so the article or the the uh, email or the pdf whatever it is and of course what you get back in audio form is a computer voice now the examples that i've heard so far it's actually pretty good i'm i've, I've ne oh, not never really been a big fan of things like siri and, and you know these automated uh, audio voices but this isn't bad and you can also which is quite fun you can also decide whether you want it to have a certain accent or not i haven't tried all of them yet but you can choose different regional accents and obviously if whichever country you're in you can choose <laughs> languages as well so you can probably have quite a bit of fun with that um but I, I guess what they're aiming is is people who've got a lot of stuff to read and probably haven't got the time to actually sit down and, and physically pour through all the words you upload it i mean imagine you're you've got a big report that you've got to get through you upload this and they fire you back an audio file and you can listen to it as you're driving along or as you're mowing the lawn or whatever it might 
might be. And I think that's quite a fascinating idea uh, because normally you think, I'm just going to listen to a podcast or I'm just going to listen to a radio show or I'm just going to listen to an audio book. And what this is doing is it's turning work stuff into audio. So it sounded quite interesting so i'd love to know if anybody's using this so hit us up on uh, twitter or 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 um on the youtube channel and leave a comment and let us know what you think of elegance second thing is a video now this is a new camera i saw peter mckinnon talking about this the other day now peter mckinnon is a massive youtuber he's got millions and millions and millions of subscribers but he's an expert in video and cameras this thing is called insta 360 go it's classed as an action camera so it's in the same sort of bracket as gopros and that sort of thing but pascal this thing is literally that big it's about half an inch across and about an inch long and it just looks like a brooch and you can literally just pin it onto your jacket as a lapel or you could pin it onto your jumper or whatever it is and it's tiny tiny little camera and yet it's shooting in hd uh, now there are there are some limitations to it i think each each burst of filming can't be more than a minute long um, and obviously it's got limited audio capability given its size but if it's just action stuff you're after you know you were doing a bungee jump for example then pin it on, dive down, and you've got your footage. Now, I came across this actually watching another YouTube vlogger. And this guy was just, oh, I'm using this camera, and it's absolutely fantastic. And, and one of the things that is so good of it is so small that it people don't get their attention drawn by it. And now I have to say, that's true. You know, one of the things I hate about vlogging, even though I love vlogging, is if I go into town, I've got my camera, I've got my tripod, I've got my big furry dead cat uh, microphone thing on top. It you, it makes you look like a bit of a dick, doesn't it? Or a little bit of a prat wandering <laughs> around with a camera like that. Where something like this is, is, is so much smaller and so much more... Um, convenient but then this guy said and you know and, and, and a lot of people don't like being filmed anyway and I just thought hold on a second are you actually saying this is going to allow you to film people without them knowing it you're not really saying that are you I don't think he was but it did cross my mind that this, these cameras are getting so so smaller that potentially there is a sort of sinister thing that could be going on you could you could hide it in somebody's house and film them when they don't know it and things like that so whilst i think it's a fabulous idea it just make you wonder whether cameras are getting so small and the fact that a camera of a certain size at least is going to be something that people can see so be interesting again if anybody's tried this out it's quite expensive it's about 350 quid so i don't think i'll be buying one but certainly the images that i've seen on this on um, peter mckinnon's uh, video and the one that this uh, vlogger was using for his travels the quality is incredible and you know what what that would allow you to do some very interesting uh, povs you know point of views and and yes. uh, b-roll or cutaways as i prefer to call them can i just go back to the first option as well could it be used as added value? So let's say for argument's sake, you've written a um, long form article on your website. Could you actually then get that um, transferred into an audio form, albeit obviously using AI, and then add that as a uh, additional way in which someone can consume your content? Is that, do you think it will be possible? Yeah, I think that that would be absolutely um, spot on. I'm not sure whether you can upload it, get the audio, and then uh -huh. share that audio with other people. That's something we'd have to clarify. But if you could, then, yeah, it would be a great way of um, repurposing your content. Yeah, just to give people the option and to be seen again, to be helpful uh, as well for your audience. Thanks for that. It's very, very interesting. Now, for me, I'm going to be closing for a while my quest for truth and knowledge about creating and delivering better online presentations. I'm going to move on to a different theme next week roger but um only this week i was back learning more about creating amazing webinars from on 24 and my go-to expert you know webby nerd mark bornstein so i think people now know that you're a big fan of mark ritson i'm a big fan of mark bornstein <laughs> so they're both marks and mark gave a with colleagues from on 24 gave a great presentation addressing us you know the deliverers and creators of those online experiences asking the question is that truly the best you can do 
What I mean by that was in particular, it's the best you can do before the event and after the event. And what he was saying is we still sometimes caught up into being quite efficient and be very operationally driven when we do webinars. So once somebody subscribes, they get an automated reply, then they get automated reminders, and they get a thank you at the end. But it's all done via email, all very uninspiring kind of words, you know, on, on, on the web page and so on. So it was suggesting that we should create the excitement of of uh, the before and after as if it was a real event. And I think that he was su suggesting that we should do more with our communication. So for example, if someone's going to come on the webinar, they subscribe. Yes, of course, you know, the, d the default position is for them to get an email saying, thank you, here's the details again, please add to your Google Calendar and all those things which are just you know, not quite exciting. It was suggesting why don't you actually confirm their attendance with a brochure, which nowadays you can do online, which is what you would get if Roger you went to a conference. You would get the pack, you know, the what they call it again, the delegates pack or the swag yeah. bag, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So you can do it digitally. You can give them vouchers for things and so on. And he got us thinking about this idea of how do you give somebody the brochure of their event and i came across this platform called slide bean being as in what you can eat slidebean.com uses ai to create really professional looking online brochures and sales presentations i mean literally you, you would you thought someone actually designed this from a design background so you can just drag and drop your words and your images and so on and it gets laid out some very clever you know cropping of the photography some very interesting layout and typography that helps you create an online brochure that welcomes people again, confirms all the details, give the um, the speakers and the hosts you know, the spotlights and so on. But it just looks stunning, almost that you would want to print it. So I think that's a lovely way to do a before experience. Then he was talking about after. So they've been on the webinar and of course, you know, you've got to do the follow-up. So what do you normally do? where you send an email, you send a link to the PDF version of the slides. Boring, you know, just <laughs> what people have been doing for that. So what he's saying is, what can you do to make it truly interactive? So I came across this platform called Flow Vela, Flow as in water flowing and Vela, uh, V-E-L-L-A. And this allows you to create interactive presentations where people can actually decide how to consult the document by clicking on many options, on numbers, on images, and navigate essentially your after sales pack, if you will, as they see fit, you can add videos, you can add PDF downloads and so on. So again, this could all be done via an email. You know, all those links and information could be done into an email. But why don't you show more care and attention? Why don't you extend the experience by creating an interactive brochure as a follow-up, you know, kind of action for yourselves? Wow. I mean, over the last few weeks, Pascal, you've really pulled some rabbits out of the <laughs> metaphorical hat. Um, and, and, you know, we're all still putting together presentations we're all still doing online presentations and one day hopefully we will get back to doing things in real life and we, we're all benefiting from these great ideas but you're absolutely right you know some of these things I hadn't thought about the brochure thing yep great idea and slide bean is definitely something that I'm going to be diving into after this show's finished to have a look at it because I've got a few things coming up over the next few weeks which could definitely benefit from these things you've been uh, drawing to my attention. So thanks, Pascal. No problem at all. And I think it's important that we start to build together um, almost like the toolkit of the future. You know, I think you and I and all our viewers and listeners, we have our go-to applications. And, and I think with regard to marketing tech and apps, it's given you and I the discipline to be more curious and research more, but also thinking, yeah, my 2021 toolkit to do what I do better, it's got to be different to the 2019 toolkit. That makes any sense, Roger? Yes. And that's why I love this segment. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I love the I love the uh, the terminology toolkit because that's exactly what it is. So, as I've said before, Roger, none of this would be possible without pioneers and inventors from the distant and more recent past. Let's move on to this week in history. 
1889, the Eiffel Tower officially opens in Paris. Built for the Exposition Universelle, the tower took two years to build, and at 300 metres high, it retained the record for the tallest man-made structure for 41 years. Wow. Well, in 1921, Professor Albert Einstein arrives in New York to give a lecture on his new theory of relativity. That year, he won the Nobel Prize for Physics for the explanation of the photoelectric effect. In 1952, considered the greatest musical comedy ever made, Singing in the Rain, starring Gene Kelly, Debbie Reynolds, Donald O'Connor and Gene Hagen, premieres at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. In 1976, a 20-year-old Harvard student called Bill Gates gives the opening address at the first annual World Altair Com Computer Convention in Albuquerque. Bill Gates, along with Paul Allen, helped develop the version of the basic language sold with the Altair computer. In 1983, the TRS-80 Model 100 becomes one of the first portable computers in a notebook-style design. Its built-in modem made it very popular with journalists who could write stories in the field and then transmit them back to their offices. In 1996, Twister, starring Ellen Hunt and the late Bill Paxton, becomes the first film to be put on DVD, making the Boeing 707 jet engine used to create the wind effects sound even better. In 1999, Melissa becomes the first email virus to cause widespread damage infected up to 250,000 computers around the world in one weekend using a combination of Microsoft Word and Outlook. And in 2001, the first public version of the Mac OS X 10.0 is released. For marketing purposes, the code name was Cheetah, a practice that has continued ever since with the latest version called Big Sure. Some great, great slices of memory lane there, Pascal. Oh, absolutely. Can I, can I just mention the Eiffel Tower? Um, I've, o I've only ever been up the Eiffel Tower once. Um, in fact, I, I, I've only been to Paris about three times in my life, believe it or not. Uh, but the only time I've been up the Eiffel Tower was when I was about 15 and I went on a school trip. And I remember to this day, you know, the Eiffel Tower was just the, we had to go up the Eiffel Tower. And what I hadn't realised is that the, the lifts, the elevators, for the first two stages, because of the shape of the tower, they almost, they're almost like, I don't know, a cross between, a, well, I don't, it's almost like a, they hang from the rails, don't they? And they go up on, and, and, the, and the baskets or the cars that the people stand in must have some sort of pivoting mechanism so that as the, as the angle of the tower changes, the, the cars compensate. And then, of course, once you get to, I think it's the, third, the second stage, the elevators that go from there to the very top are standard ones that go up vertically. But that was a massive memory from my childhood, being absolutely blown away by the elevators that go up the Eiffel Tower. Now, I do still to this day, and of course, I'm going to come across as being very biased, but it is to this day quite an achievement. And we lived in Paris for several, five, six years when I was uh, very young. And I actually used the steps with my dad as a, as a dare. <laughs> it just <laughs> took forever. Honestly, I was absolutely exhausted by the end of it. But um, you went all the way to the top. Yeah, well, you can't oh. go to the top, the very top. You have to have uh, like special permissions and so on. But certainly, as far as the public, you know, area was, we oh. used the steps because um, I, I said you know it could be done or whatever it was. Oh my goodness, that is a long way up. <laughs> So I was very pleased for you to mention Singing in the Rain, as you know, one of my favorite uh, musical comedy of all times. But I think also because the film is such a wonderful story about you know, the transition from silent film to talkies, as, as the term was at the time, and the many mistakes they make with sound recordings, which you and I can relate to, <laughs> as well as, of course, you know, the love story between Jim Kelly and Debbie Reynolds. Yeah, they, they and it's often a film that comes up in quizzes, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> frequently, frequently. I remember playing on a TRS eighty, um, not the one that was mentioned in this news article because it was a proper desktop style computer. But I was trying to think who made the TRS eighty. What was the what was the company? Was it Tandy? It wasn't Tandy, was it? Don't know. Uh, I don't think we had that in France as such, but um, I can only imagine, you know, the, the marketing kind of um, spiel about, you know, it has a built-in modem and yeah. people just rushing it thinking, brilliant, I can plug to the telephone line, make some silly sounds in the room, but also get my story to the uh, back to the office. 
And I didn't realise that uh, the Twister effects uh, in the in that film Twister was actually made from a Boeing 707 jet engine. But uh, you can understand why, because yeah. if you've ever stood near uh, a jet engine, you know the power, not only of the, the force that comes out of the jet engine, but the noise, of course. I mean, it is not something that we try in terms of including always <laughs> reference to aircraft and, and Boeing 7-something, you know, for as part of... Um, to gigs and marketing podcasts, but I suppose you know that they are part of uh, again that achievement in terms of uh, aeronautics and and obviously technology. But um, going back to the young Bill Gates giving the giving the opening address at the first annual World Computer Convention at the age of twenty, Roger yourself would you have given an opening address to a conference? <laughs> My goodness, would I not? I mean, but when I was 20, I think the the, the nearest I'd got to an opening address was uh, standing up and giving a, a small presentation to a tutorial group at uh, Leeds, the aforementioned Leeds University. It was probably about economics. So, uh, no, I mean, again, I, I don't think I actually started presenting to audiences until my late 20s once I'd started working in big corporate. So hats off to Bill Gates, of course. And, yeah, again, I can remember loading up basic into some of those earlier computers with you know a cassette yeah. tape you had to actually load the basic language into the computer before you could use it and it was it wasn't always successful for memory sometimes mm -hmm. you try to load the program in my case on my auric atmos my 48k of ram <laughs> and then nothing happens because it hasn't worked so you have to then rewind the tape and then try again um, hoping that on this this time it, it would work. I had the um, the the kind of uh, role playing game, The Hobbit, which was uh, text only. So yep. literally, you would have to you would read the description, and then you would say, you know, go north or pick axe, you know, things like this, and then something else would would happen. But they, these were the early days of RPGs. Of course, now you know what things you can do on the PS Five or the Xbox. It's just incredible. Yeah. Oh dear me. Basic. I remember one of them was called Baz G, um, and that was basic plus graphics, and that allowed you to plot little little pixels and sprites on the screen, and cr and that's when we started trying to create our own versions of Space Invaders. Gosh, we are going down a bit of a rabbit hole this week, Pascal. <laughs> we are indeed, but that's what this segment is all about this week in history. We are inheriting, you know, the invention of visionary, visionaries and, and pioneers. And, and I love this moment of reflection on both, you know, reminiscing about our youth, because obviously if it wasn't a thing for my dad who saw the signs that computing would be important and started to introduce them in, in, in a home environment, I don't think I would be as interested and perhaps would have a very different career. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, I mean, our generation, gen, Generation X, on the whole, uh, we've sort of lived in the pre digital and post-digital worlds and, and some of us haven't embraced it at all and I think that those of us like you and I who haven't embraced the digital world have got people to thank for that you've got your father to thank I've got my father but also a teacher at school Mr Turner who actually used to let us take the computer home at weekends really wow you know, you, you, you know we, he had this youth research machines 380z it was quite a big cumbersome thing and you used to book it pretty much at the start of the school year and you could book it to take it home so it was like you would take it home on a Friday and I literally didn't go to sleep for the entire weekend because I was just playing on this computer and it was so exciting and you just think what we've got now and and I wonder I don't want to come across as um, you know whatever but I wonder with the the sense of excitement it is still there you know when those we, we talk about new apps coming along we talk about tiktok and so on and, and i sometimes wish people would just slow down and realize that this is the stuff of science fiction i mean yeah. this is the stuff that you and i would watch on star trek and go one day one i'm day. able to do a video call you know whatever that is absolutely right absolutely right i remember one day at school having an argument with a kid because i'd drawn this picture i quite quite prophetically i'd drawn this picture which actually looked a bit like a, a new iphone where there was a screen and i said you know you could you could actually film people and he was oh that's ridiculous that's that's science fiction but hey here we are here we are and just to close on this week in history although i'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation <laughs> so i mentioned briefly 1921 albert einstein giving his lecture so that's 100 years ago yeah 
Mm. Mm. Wow. I mean, just just you know, it just occurred to me because sometimes you forget about those things that um, that's a year won the Nobel Pri Nobel Prize for physics when he was trying to explain some of these theories that to this day are still being used. And of course, those theories have also prompted so many things in science fiction again, haven't mm -hmm. they? You know, the theory of relativity says that you technically can't fly faster than light. So that's why we had to invent warp drive in order to uh, <laughs> effectively get over some of these theories. Even though we can't travel faster than, as fast as light yet, we've already started thinking about how we might go faster. It's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I think we should move on, Pascal, otherwise yes. we'll end up talking about this far too much. <laughs> but abuse and listeners can see why this is by far one of my favourite segments. I mean, I like everything we do about two gigs of marketing podcasts, but this ability to see the and join the dot in terms of we are where we are because of things that have happened in the past is just um, wonderful. But let's go back into the present and let's move on to our creator's shout outs. So, Roger, who have you got on the spotlight today? Okay, this week I've got an article from a lady called Amy Keane. Now, I have to say, Amy isn't in my normal circle. Uh, she appeared in my LinkedIn timeline purely because a friend of mine, Matt Desmier, had commented upon her post. And that's one of the great things about LinkedIn, is it introduces you to new people by that sort of method. Now, Amy has written a fabulous article about Clubhouse, and we've talked about Clubhouse on the podcast quite a bit, but I love the angle that Amy's taken with this. So the title of the article is Clubhouse, Addictive or Sheer and Utter Waffle, Young Creatives Sound Off. And she's interviewed some young creators, as the title would was, was, um, suggest, and she obviously describes what Clubhouse is, how you get in, what it can be used for, and stuff like that. But I think this absolutely captures what I'm thinking about Clubhouse at the moment. I'm still not convinced where I'm falling with Clubhouse, whether I like it or whether I don't. There's a lot of egos on Clubhouse. There's a lot of stupid talk about millionaires giving tips how to become billionaires and stuff like that. And and, and just some of the comments that these young people have actually given Amy to include in her article, it's just, just great. Some of them are addictive, uh, a mixed bag, sheer and utter waffle. And this is my favourite, the fire Festival of mobile apps. Now, of course, if anybody uh, can remember, fire Festival was an absolute and utter disastrous uh, mm. influencer event that never happened in, a, in, a, in, B in Bermuda or, or the Bahamas or something like that. So if you are undecided about Clubhouse, or even if you just want to find out a little bit more about Clubhouse, but you want to find out about it in a, a relatively light-hearted way, then read Amy Keane's article. We'll, uh, we'll put the link in the show notes, as always, and maybe connect with Amy as well, because I think she posts quite a lot of really interesting content. Excellent thing. And I think you're right about LinkedIn and the ability to discover new connections. I think they're doing a very good job, uh, better than most other social networks, I would argue. For me, this week, the spotlight is on the lady called Kerry Hycock, who recently published her very first book, Roger. Right. So to begin with, congratulations. We know how much work goes into creating, writing the book, getting it published, and so on. And Kerry works for the Northeast Autism Society. As you know, a charity very close to my heart. She's the Family Development Manager, and her role is to support family with children on the spectrum to essentially make sure that they can have the strategies to cope with what is required and make sure that their children have as rich a life as possible. And lockdown has been obviously a challenge for families with children on the spectrum, which is why I use the term of coping, not necessarily to be negative, but it has been putting more pressure. Now, Kerry has been able to, for over the last few years, give so much advice, but also learn so much from those families that I think she's used the book to capture you know, her observations and conclusion. Now, she's been a live streamer for a while now. She's also been creating uh, blog articles, resources. She's been interviewing people who are active in as part of uh, neurodiversity. So the book is called The Infinite Journey, 
Recollections and Reflections on Life as an Autism Practitioner. And judging by the reviews of uh, people who have read the book who essentially are concerned about, you know, this particular subject, I think she's captured, you know, both the emotion but also the practical suggestion that you need to simply make sure that neurodiversity is just part of life and everybody can have as rich a life as possible. So, Kerry, congratulations for many years of work that you've done as part of your work as an autism practitioner, but also well done on getting the book published. Sounds great, Pascal. I've got some family friends who have experienced um, this condition, so it's definitely something that needs a you know needs more attention. I think. No, absolutely, and and I'm just so pleased about it. So there we are. That was the creator shout outs for this week. Some fine selections again, Roger. But it is time to move on to film marketing. So Pascal, this film is called Triangle, and it's one of my favourite modern horror films. Well, I say modern horror films, I'm not sure whether it is a horror film, or whether it's a science fiction film, or whether it's a fantasy film, or I'm not actually sure what it is, but what it absolutely is, is utterly, utterly compelling and utterly, utterly fascinating. And it actually has a plot which makes you want to go away and do research after you've watched it to try and work out what on earth is going on. Now, I think that when we get into the discussion about this film, and particularly the marketing, I think we'll come to the conclusion that the marketing for this film let it down. Because when I first saw the posters for the film and the strap line, well, actually, I'll read you the strap line. It says, a single mother goes on a boating trip with several friends. When they are forced to abandon their ship, they board a derelict ocean liner where they become convinced that someone is stalking them. Now, the posters for the film have this lady, she's called um, Jess, on the ship, and in the background, there's a masked man with uh, with a gun. And when you see that poster, you think, oh, it's just a slasher film on a ship. You know, it could be Scream or it could be uh, Friday the 13th. It's just set on a ship. And admittedly, when you watch the film, within that first 20 minutes when they arrive on the ship, there is indeed a masked person with a gun. And you do think this is, this is just a slasher film on a ship. And then it absolutely hits you in the face with this sort of genre shift plot twist which just completely and utterly changes it and from that moment on it's anything but a slasher film on a ship but I suspect that a lot of people might not have even gone to watch it because they thought it was going to be a slasher film because of the marketing so have you seen this film Pascal? Well, yes, and but very late. I think uh, this movie was released in two thousand and nine for yeah. for memory, and yeah. I only saw it more recently thanks to Amazon Prime. Mm. But we're going to talk about the marketing in a moment because I think it had a role to play in me missing it. I mean, I would say two thousand and nine. I was suddenly very, very attentive to what was being released. Uh, I was watching an enormous amount of uh, films to learn actually about film production. And this one, I just missed it, which is strange because the director and the writer, Christopher Smith, um, is known to me because he did the really great uh, horror thriller called Creep. I don't know if you've seen that one mm, of his, mm. uh, Severin, which is so good, like very proper dark, dark humor. Black Death, obviously, with, with Sean Bean, a detour. And more recently, because of lockdown, once again, our consumption has gone through the roof. I've been watching the Alex Ryder TV series, yeah. um, which were really so well pulled together and I'm looking forward to his new work called The, the Banishing. So yeah. how have a missed triangle is is um is a mystery to me. Yeah and uh and did you did you feel when you were watching it, oh, this is just going to be a slasher movie. And no, actually, got... I thought it was going to be a survival movie. <laughs> ah, okay. So, okay. So because I kind of got a sense that they were going to you know, be stuck on the boat. Uh, yep. And I thought it was maybe some of, the, some of the others I've seen where there's a one which the, the title escapes me where they, they jump in the sea to swim, but then they forgot to put the ladder down so they can't get back on the boat. So ah, yeah, yeah. I thought it would be a survival movie. Then I thought it was going to be a slasher movie. Then when I 
got it, I got so excited. I mean, I was literally almost saying that is, this is amazing, this is amazing, because I'm also, which I think hints into what we're going to discuss in a moment, I'm also a huge, huge fan of Greek and Roman mythology. Mm. When I was a kid, mm. uh, we used to go to the library. People don't know what that is anymore, but you know, we used to go to the library. And I used to get all the books and read the Greek and Roman mythology for cover to cover. And I kind of knew a bit about the um, the story that had been used. Um, I, I just think this is a movie that people need to rediscover. And and I'm glad we're doing a, a bit of uh, a promotion here today. Yeah, and it's admittedly, Pascal, it'd be very, very difficult to talk about the plot of the film without ruining the surprise. Suffice to say, what we've said so far is true. Both you and I thought that this film was going to be something other than what it turned out to be. And honestly, when it hits you with its this is this sort of pivotal moment about 20, 30 minutes in, when you it just changes and you think, oh my God, where did that come from? And 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 certainly where is it going? It is it, it really does make you sit up and think. And since then, you know, I've gone on to Google, I've Googled the film and people have written, you know, theses about this film. Yeah. And, and the paradoxes and you know as a as a film producer and director yourself there are some of the film uh, cinematography and and some of the framing of the shots in this film are remarkable um and I, again i can't give away the plot but it, it, because it it it, uh, it has a time travel element in it as well, the way that they suggest the passage of time by framing different characters in different ways is absolutely fascinating. Before you even get into all the the sort of the backdrop of the Greek legends and and, and all of that sort of thing, and and that's another rabbit hole you can go down. Just just going back and looking at the the Greek legend upon which this is based. I think you're right. We need to compliment Christopher Smith and his, uh, obviously, team around design, the design of, uh, obviously, the different environment. If you're into that kind of things, I would encourage people to watch for the horizontal lines and how they've been used. Yeah. But if you don't yeah. care, just watch the film and enjoy it nonetheless. But but also, you're right, you know, this would have been scripted superbly. I think that had to be storyboarded to perfection because otherwise you would get confused even just as a producer, storyteller, because typically films are rarely shot in the you know chronological order so you end up having to do scene 10 first then move on to scene one then go back to scene 24 um but i would say that your kind of uh, question about is this a horror film i think it is because what is happening to the lead character is truly horrible if you think yeah. about it, what is happening to her uh, once you understand um, to, the last, to the very last frame, once you understand what is happening to her, this is this is kind of chilling, uh, truthfully. And there are some moments in in the in the movie where something is revealed, where literally you are just completely gobsmacked, and it's not shocking. It's not using the tricks of you know the music changing, and suddenly there's like this it's tracking the piano chord, whatever. It just the camera just moves and reveals something, and you just mm. go, "Oh my god, this is horrible!" <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely, and it, and and it's not particularly gory i mean in fairness there's, there's quite a lot of blood in the bits where where you again you're thinking oh this is a slasher film um but mainly it's just the concept of what's being done to this this jess character played fantastically by melissa george i have to say she acts her socks off in this film and and you know the mental trauma that she's going through is just as you say, really quite scary to think about. Um, so absolute, you know, kudos to this actress. And, and again, it, this film seems to have been missed by so many people. And she obviously got missed by all the different awards ceremonies at the time, which is a real shame because I think this is an incredible performance. And that's, I think, what we need to get into. So we know that this was an Anglo-Australian production, which is great. Yep. You know, so you had uh, support from the UK Film Council, and I think the equivalent would be a Screen Australia, and then other kind of indie uh, production companies. And and I think you know what you're now saying is bravo to the filmmakers, but then we need to challenge the distributors and the financiers to say, really, you know, when you create something as good as Triangle, you've got to continue the effort and put the the kind of uh, marketing machine into kind of overdrive. And I think what was what happened was just they did the, the the essentials. They just did the what was expected of them, and that wasn't sufficient. That wasn't actually in line with how 
brilliant the film is. Yeah, and I know again, I come back to some of the marketing materials, um, you know, and I've got them on the screen here, Pascal, and so many of them just focus on the masked man, and you just think, oh, this is this is this is just going to be a slasher movie. I mean, some of them tease a little bit. One of them says it will twist you and terrify you over and over and over, which is mm-hmm. quite an interesting hint at what what's going. Um, some of the posters actually. Sh- actually have splits in the screen which suggest some of the recurring themes that happen within the film but on the whole you know it's it's just it's just a bit of a mediocre marketing campaign and and you're absolutely right think why make such an incredibly deep detailed film why shoot it so incredibly well why squeeze such an incredible performance of your leading lady and then almost completely you know let 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 it go out there with it without any decent promotion i i just don't get it maybe they ran out of money but i don't know but it's just uh, it's just uh, a, a real shame again is this this is a bit that is at, at, at other hands of the um of the filmmakers, so Christopher Smith, you know, Melissa George, also, of course, they had Liam Hemsworth and uh, Michael Dorman, you know, and, and a few other actors. They all kind of worked their socks off, but then the product is finished, they move on, and this is now taken over by the distributors and the marketers. And yes, this was presented at the um, London Fright Fest, which is great. Yes, it has some limited theatrical release, but then you know, it just didn't really given the uh, the push. I think there was too many distributors kind of passing on almost like a, this, like a hot potatoes. Because ultimately, we're not the only one agreeing with that. Um, this movie had thumbs up from Rotten Tomatoes, from Time Out, from Empire Magazine. You had um, people, the uh, film critics in the garden saying, you know, this will leave you suitably shaken. Uh, this is a smart, interestingly constructed, scary movie, creating real some real shivers. So others did agree with, with our conclusion, Roger. And it just essentially is for us, you know, the lesson which is, the the work in crafting the content is is not the end you've got to then allow enough energy enough time and resources budget you're right roger to then market the content otherwise you're going to have to rely on people like you and i to kind of give it a shout out nearly 12 years later yeah and you know i i've i've watched this film about four or five times now and mm. every time i watch it i end up going off onto the internet looking for some of the explanation articles again. Now, now may, maybe I'm giving the wrong impression here. I don't want to suggest that what happens in the film is so baffling that it, it, it makes it unenjoyable to watch. It's incredibly enjoyable to watch, but it is, it is quite a, a, a mind-blowing concept. And I, I almost wanted to go a bit, dig a little bit deep. You know, you have to understand... Um, the, the Greek legend upon which the film is based. Now, they do explain it in the film, if you listen, mm-hmm. uh, but if you want to go into it in a little bit more detail, you know, there's so much material out there. That, and, and the concept of the of the uh, trauma that Jess is going through, you know, as I say, people have written theses about it. Now, it's interesting. Um, in 2009, I read quite a lot of um, articles about what was happening to her and at the time I thought wow this is a little bit too complicated and I think as the time's gone by people have written more and more articles and actually what's happening to her is is not as complicated perhaps as some of the people thought right at the start and and the clue the clues are all over the screen the name of the film triangle is a clue in itself now it's actually the name of the boat that they start off sailing on but triangle itself is a massive clue to what's going on on and they always do think say that things come in threes and i'm not going to say anything else apart from that things come in threes please watch this film if you've never seen it before don't go into it with any expectations of it being a specific genre because whatever your expectation is going to be it will be absolutely knocked out of the park after about 25 30 minutes 
And, and as you can tell, you'll be talking about it with your, you know, friends and family and, and other film goers for quite some time. And, and you're right, it's it's really the mark of a good film when conversation uh, are kind of um, encouraged. But also like you, I went back and researched because I knew about the legends, but of course, I read the books a long time ago. And it was a real pleasure to, to delve back into it and go, oh, I see, um, because of the name of the cruise line and, and this and that. Um, so again, what is is lovely is that you get a little hint of the amount of hard work and the amount of attention to details that the filmmakers have put in and i think it's lovely to be part of this complicity for a bit as well absolutely yeah so ab top top <laughs> top range film top range film 10 out of 10 five star whatever you want to call it Excellent. Well, this is probably the first time that you and I have gotten so excited about a film that's perhaps not as well known as in some of the selections we've done in the past, but this is well deserved. And it's only 10 years old as opposed to 35 years as well. <laughs> Absolutely. This was episode 33 of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Please leave your comments, suggestions, and reflections for future episodes in the usual places. I was Pascal Fintoni, and he was Roger Edwards. Until the next one, please go out there and make sure your marketing is done right. Right.